I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankarayas Academy for the newspaper dated 28th of January 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. We will begin with the first article discussion. Now let us take this editorial article for our first discussion. This article says that there are some moral and intellectual crises which are affecting the Indian economic policies. In Davos, at the World Economic Forum session, the chairman of Tata Sons said that, for me, the three things most important are growth, growth and growth. On another instance, in Delhi, 150 homeless people had been removed from beneath a flyover ahead of the G20 events to be held in the city. The author quotes these two instances to show that there is clearly a crisis in the Indian economic policies. So in this discussion today, we will see what are the problems that are associated in the Indian economic policies. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. First of all, the problem is the declining employment elasticity. This means that the job creation is not directly proportional to the demand for jobs. The second problem is that jobs that are available are not with any social security such as healthcare pension, especially for the unorganized sector that makes up for most of the country's employment. Thirdly, in India, the organized manufacturing and service sectors are employing few people per unit of capital. So what does this mean? The investors are bringing in more capital and there is no problem there. But to effectively make use of this capital, we need employees. But the industries are not hiring enough. This is worrying because conventional economics says that more people should move out of agriculture and rural areas. These people should be taken into cities and into manufacturing and modern services. But there are only few opportunities in the organized manufacturing and service sectors. Right? So, we are not able to move people out of agriculture. Fourthly, as per the economist, the Indian economy's problem is the large size of its informal sector and small scale of its enterprises. But this problem is not so significant because economies in the world are also changing the forms of large enterprises and creating more informality of employment. The informality of employment is brought into the formal sector through outsourcing, contract employment and gig work. Fifthly, there is a problem with the form of the economy itself. According to economists, there are few women in the workforce. More women in the workforce will help the economy to grow faster. But don't think that there are no women at all in the workforce. They have been working in the farms and as caregivers, domestic workers, municipal sweepers, weavers and producers of handicrafts in small enterprises. They are even employed as teachers and as ASHA workers. But the economists are saying that the percentage of working women is very low compared to working men. So, the author is saying that pushing more women into the formal economy will improve the female participation rate in the formal economy. Besides this, the young and underemployed males are involving in more crimes, violence and sexual assaults of women in Indian cities. This is majorly due to the unavailability of jobs. Finally, the author of the editorial is saying that growth of GDP is like a disease. It kills both natural and social resources. How? As we all see, daily natural resources are converted into commodities to feed the economic mission. And social resources, that is humans, they are exploited and human work and intelligence are considered as commodities for producing value for investors in capitalist enterprises. So, according to the author, the paradigm of growth, growth, growth treats human society and nature as a means of its goals. The goals being producing more wealth for investors and more GDP. Why author is saying this? Let me explain you with an example. Consider a platform service which is hiring motorcycle riders to deliver packages. This service cares only about the efficiency of the work. 
they won't care about the human needs such as safety health etc this is because providing any social security will only increase the cost of doing business so they only pay these riders for on time delivery this is exactly why the author is saying the paradigm of growth is exploiting human resources according to the author growth of gdp is not the purpose of human civilization the purpose is to find a path to reach purna swaraj in all aspects that is social political and economic freedom for all indians how can this be achieved first of all economic growth must be created by equal opportunities for all to learn and earn with dignity and it should not harm the natural environment that sustains all life secondly the economic development should be an inclusive one all should gain from the growth of economy and not just a small portion of wealthy people thirdly a new paradigm of economic science and policy is required so in this discussion we saw what are the moral and intellectual issues that are associated with our economic policies we discussed how they affect the people and why growth in terms of gdp alone is not significant finally we saw some ways to design new economic policies so with these points in mind we will move on to the next article discussion see this editorial article it talks about the significance of the groundwater now suddenly it is in news because of the theme of the un world water day 2022 the theme of the un world water day 2022 was groundwater making the invisible visible The theme is a reflection of the importance given to this resource across the globe. So in this discussion let us understand some important points mentioned in this article. Before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. Go through it. Now let's start the discussion. See groundwater is the fresh water that occurs below the surface of earth. It occupies all or part of the void spaces in soil or geological strata. According to data India has nearly 18% of world's population which occupies about 2.4% of the total geographical area but we have only 4% of the world's total water resources a world bank report says that India is the largest groundwater user yes groundwater is the backbone of India's agriculture and drinking water security for example If you see the groundwater meets nearly 80% of the country's drinking water needs and 2/3 of our irrigation needs. Even though the groundwater is pivotal to India's water security, its exploitation is a major issue. In reality, the growing population is straining the country's groundwater resources and this is where the government comes into play. The central government is actually working to achieve the goal of sustainable groundwater management in collaboration with the states and union territories. Some important deliverables were identified and those are reducing the groundwater extraction to below 70%, then increasing the network of groundwater observation wells, installing digital water level recorders for real time monitoring of groundwater level, then periodic monitoring of water quality aquifer mapping and data dissemination then we are also focusing on better regulation of groundwater extraction by industries further we are also trying to bring in multi stakeholder participation for managing groundwater then we are also emphasizing on the periodic groundwater resource assessment Apart from this in May 2019 the government moved one step ahead and created the Jal Shakti Ministry basically the objective of this ministry is to tackle all water related issues it is the merger of ministry of water resources river development and ganga rejuvenation and ministry of drinking water and sanitation one of the programs implemented by the ministry of jal shakti is the jal jeevan mission The objective of the Jal Jeevan Mission is to supply 55 liters of water per person per day to every rural household through functional household tap connection by 2024. Now talking about the strategy of the mission, see 
the jal jeevan mission primarily focuses on integrated demand and supply side management of water at the local level the mission also mandates creation of local infrastructure for source sustainability such infrastructure includes rainwater harvesting groundwater recharge and the management of household wastewater for reuse all these have to be done in collaboration with other government programs or schemes most importantly the mission is based on a community based approach to water there are extensive information education and communication as key components of this scheme to put it in simple words the mission ensures functionality of existing water supply systems and water connections water quality monitoring and testing as well as sustainable agriculture it also ensures conjunctive use of conserved water and drinking water resource augmentation including grey water treatment and its reuse so what is this grey water it is all the waste water generated in households or office buildings from streams and this does not contain any fecal contamination now we will see other initiatives taken by the government for effective management and regulation of ground water for example the national project on aquifer management so this project was initiated in the year 2012 as a part of the ground water management and regulation scheme its objective is to delineate and characterize the aquifers and develop plans for sustainable groundwater management in the country characterization is done through mapping of the aquifers here aquifers are nothing but an underground layer of permeable rocks that bear water this mapping of subsurface water helps in gathering authentic data and enables informed decision making from the available mappable area of nearly 25 lakh square kilometer around 24 lakh square kilometers of the country has been mapped a heliborn based survey has also been used along with traditional exploratory methods for rapid and accurate aquifer mapping the remaining area is likely to be mapped by march 2023 Based on these mapping, region-wise aquifer management plans are being prepared and they are shared with the states. Apart from this, a software named India Groundwater Resource Estimation (INGRES) has also been developed to access the groundwater resources. So, with this software, dynamic groundwater assessment can be done annually. As per the author, these efforts have yielded some results. The groundwater assessment report. of 2022 indicates a positive inclination in the management of groundwater according to the assessment there has been a 3% reduction in the number of over exploited groundwater units as compared to 2017 further overall extraction saw a declining trend of about 3.25% since 2017 so we can conclude that the government's interventions are having a positive impact all we have to do is participate and cooperate with the government as per the assessment we have created 9.37 billion cubic meters of additional groundwater potential through artificial water conservation structures with community participation we can do more so this is what the author is trying to convey through this article So in this discussion we saw about the status of groundwater extraction in India then we also saw some steps that are taken by the government to manage groundwater sustainably in specific we saw some major initiatives like the jal jeevan mission and national project on aquifer management this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article now we will move on to the next article discussion now look at this news article this article says that The Gujarat police filed a charge sheet in the Morbi Bridge tragedy case. This Morbi Bridge is a British era suspension bridge. On October 30, 2022, the bridge collapsed into the Machu River and around 140 were dead including 47 children. And regarding this, Gujarat police filed a charge sheet against the Oreva group that was given the contract to repair, renovate, and operate the colonial era hanging bridge. Here, we are not going to discuss about the collapse of the bridge, but we will see about the technical term charge sheet. So, what is a charge sheet? 
a charge sheet is basically a final report that is prepared by the investigation or law enforcement agencies for proving the accusation of a crime the report is submitted by the police officer in order to prove that the accused is connected with any offense or the accused has committed any offense punishable under indian law here know that the charge sheet is defined under section 173 of the criminal procedure code it says that a charge sheet is a final report prepared by a police officer or investigative agency after completing their investigation of a case here i have given what all should be there in a charge sheet as per section 173 make a note of it the names of the parties the nature of the information the names of the persons who appear to be acquainted with the circumstances of the case whether any offence appears to have been committed and if so by whom whether the accused have been arrested or he has been released on bond with or without sureties whether he has been forwarded in custody under section 170 so filing of the charge sheet indicates the end of investigation after this the report is forwarded to a magistrate or court The filing of the charge sheet with the magistrate indicates the commencement of criminal proceedings. Most importantly, a charge sheet must be filed against the accused within a prescribed period of 60 to 90 days. Otherwise, the arrest is illegal and the accused is entitled to bail. The 60 to 90 days range depends on the nature of the crime. And finally, a recent Supreme Court judgment ruled that charge sheet is not a public document under section 74 and 76 of the evidence act so here just know that charge sheet is not a public document and it cannot be viewed by everybody so with these points in mind we will move on to the next article discussion now look at this news article yesterday the environment ministry in its statement said that india and south africa have finally signed a long pending agreement So this is an arrangement to translocate 12 cheetahs to India. These cheetahs will be transported to India by February end and after that they will be reintroduced at the Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh. This is the crux of the news article. Now we will use this opportunity to quickly learn about some basic differences between the Asiatic and African cheetahs from our exam perspective. First let us see about cheetahs in general. So the cheetah is a prominent cat family member that belongs to the subfamily Felinae and its scientific name is Asinonyx jupatus. Now where do we find them? See cheetahs are found across Africa and also in some parts of Iran. They usually prefer to live in grassland habitats. This is because they have enough space to hunt their prey without any obstacles in the grassland habitats. Further as we all know cheetah is widely regarded as the fastest animal on land it is estimated that a cheetah is capable of running at 80 to 128 km per hour cheetahs are generally divided into four subspecies they are southeast african cheetah the northeast african cheetah the northwest african cheetah and the rare asiatic cheetah See the three subspecies of African cheetah are commonly termed as the African cheetah. So these are some points about the cheetahs in general. Now we will see about some basic differences between the Asiatic cheetah and the African cheetahs. Firstly, if we see their distribution, the African cheetahs are spread out across Africa from northwest Africa, east Africa and southern Africa. So as it is covering a bigger territory the african cheetahs have the highest population compared to their asian counterparts the asian cheetahs are only found in small regions between iran and pakistan now talking about their physical characteristics the african cheetahs have sturdier legs and necks their heads are bigger compared with the asiatic cheetahs If you see an adult African cheetah it can reach 84 inches in length and can weigh up to 72 kg on the other hand the asiatic cheetah is slightly smaller and slender than the african cheetah the neck of the asiatic cheetah is much smaller and longer than the african cheetah their legs are also slender and an asiatic cheetah can grow up to 53 inches in length and it can weigh up to 54 kg 
Now, if we see their population size, the African cheetahs are more in number. It is estimated that there are around 7,000 to 8,000 African cheetahs left in the African wild. Now, talking about the Asiatic cheetahs, there are less than 100 individuals left in the wild and most of them are present in Iran. Now, finally, we will see about their conservation status. African cheetahs are listed as vulnerable species in the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Whereas, if we see the Asiatic cheetahs, they are listed as critically endangered species in the Red List. Also know that both the African and Asiatic cheetahs are listed in Appendix 1 of the sites list. So, with these points in mind, now we will move on to the next article discussion. Look at this snippet article here. It is saying that yesterday the global chemical weapon watchdog blamed Syria for a 2018 chlorine attack which killed around 43 people. Investigators said that there were reasonable grounds to believe that there was a chlorine attack. They said a Syrian Air Force helicopter has dropped two cylinders of the toxic gas on the rebel-held town of Doma during the Syria civil war. So this is about the news article given here. Now, in this context, let us understand about the Chemical Weapon Convention. First of all, know that the Chemical Weapons Convention is officially called the Convention on the Prohibition of Development, Production, Stockpiling and Use of Chemical Weapons and on their Destruction. The Chemical Weapon Convention is basically a multilateral treaty that bans the chemical weapons and requires their destruction within a specific period of time. And further, the treaty is far more comprehensive than the 1925 Geneva Protocol. Now, what is this 1925 Geneva Protocol? This 1925 Geneva Protocol prohibits the use of chemical and biological weapons in war. The protocol was drawn up and signed at a conference which was held in Geneva under the auspice of the League of Nations in 1925. It entered into force on 8th of February 1928. See, the main difference between the 1925 Geneva Protocol and the Chemical Weapons Convention is that the Geneva Protocol only prohibits the use of chemical weapons. But whereas if you see the Chemical Weapons Convention, it is banning the use and it also requires the destruction of chemical weapons. The CWC negotiation started in the year 1980 in the UN Conference on Disarmament. Many negotiations happened and the convention was opened for signature on January 13, 1993. However, the convention entered into force only on April 29, 1997. The CWC is open to all the nations and it currently has 193 state parties. Now you should note one point here. Israel has signed the convention but it is yet to ratify it. Three states have neither signed nor ratified the convention. They are Egypt, North Korea and South Sudan. Now coming to India specific information, India is a signatory and a party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. India signed the treaty at Paris on 14th January 1993. Now you should also know that India was the first state party to secure the distinction of chemical weapon free state party. That is, India was the first country to destroy all its stockpile of chemical weapons amongst all the state parties of the CWC. Apart from this, India also established the National Authority Chemical Weapons Convention under the Chemical Weapons Convention Act of 2000. This was done for implementing the provisions of the CWC. Now, who is responsible for implementing the Chemical Weapon Convention? The Chemical Weapons Convention is implemented by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. This is headquartered in The Hague, Netherlands. It receives declaration from the state parties detailing chemical weapons related activities or materials and relevant industrial activities. After receiving declarations, this organization inspects and monitors state parties facilities and activities which are relevant to the convention. This is basically done to ensure the compliance with the convention. So here I have given the activities that are prohibited under CWC. Pause the video and just give a glance. 
it prohibits developing producing acquiring stockpiling or retaining chemical weapons it also prohibits direct or indirect transfer of chemical weapons any military use of the weapon is also prohibited and no party is allowed to assist or encourage or induce other states to engage in cwc prohibited activities and the chemical weapons should not be even used as a riot control agent as a method of warfare so with these points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion look at this news article here it says that india is seeking modifications to the indus water treaty this is to address the issues over the dispute settlement mechanism we will see what is the indus water treaty later in the discussion but as of now know that indus water treaty is a water sharing agreement between india and pakistan see pakistan argues that the 1960 indus water treaty gives pakistan control over the waters of the indus chenab and jhelum rivers and it said that the kishan ganga and rattle hydroelectric project violates the indus water treaty In 2010, Pakistan took the matter to the Permanent Court of Arbitration at the Hague, which stayed the project for three years. But later, in 2013, the court ruled that the Kishan Ganga was a run of the river plant within the meaning of the Indus Waters Treaty, and that India may accordingly divert water from the Kishan Ganga for power generation. In 2016, Pakistan again asked the World Bank. to appoint a court of arbitration to review the designs of the kishan ganga and another project on the chenab called the rattle india rejected the suggestion saying that pakistan's objection was technical in nature and that the matter should be decided by a neutral expert now india is seeking modifications to the indus water treaty to address the issues over the dispute settlement mechanism So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, we will learn about River Kishan Ganga and the two hydroelectric projects. Apart from this, we will also understand about the Indus Water Treaty. First, let's understand about River Kishan Ganga. See, Kishan Ganga is a river that flows in the Kashmir region of India and in the region of Pakistan occupied Kashmir. In India it is called River Kishan Ganga and in Pakistan occupied Kashmir it is called the Neelam River. It originates from Krishansar Lake in the north of Jammu and Kashmir in India. Then it flows through the Neelam district of Pakistan occupied Kashmir and then merges with the Jhelum River. So we can say that River Kishan Ganga is a tributary of the Jhelum River. The Kishan Ganga River is 245 km long and it covers 50 km in Jammu and Kashmir. Then it covers the remaining 195 km in Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Now talking about the Kishan Ganga hydroelectric project, it is located in Bandipora district of Jammu and Kashmir. It is a type of run of the river hydroelectric scheme. See, run of the river hydroelectric power station usually generates electricity using the natural downward flow of rivers. So, water is not stored or there may be very less storage of water. Now we will see in brief about the Rattle hydroelectric project. It is also a run of the river hydroelectric power station. See, it is currently under construction on the Chenab river in Kishtwar district of the Jammu and Kashmir. Now we will also understand about the Indus Water Treaty from prelims perspective. See, the Indus Water Treaty is a water sharing agreement between India and Pakistan. The agreement was signed in 1960 and it was brokered by the World Bank. As we all know, the Indus River system comprises 6 rivers. They are Indus, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi, Bias and Satluj. These 6 rivers are broadly classified into two categories. Firstly the eastern rivers which comprises Ravi Satluj and Bias then secondly there are western rivers which comprises Indus Jhelum and Chenab so as per this Indus water treaty all the waters of the three eastern rivers namely the Ravi Satluj and Bias were allocated to India for exclusive use while the waters of western rivers namely Indus Jhelum and Chenab were allocated to Pakistan but 
as specified by the treaty india can use the waters of western rivers for specified domestic non consumptive and agricultural purposes here know that india has also been given the right to generate hydroelectricity through run off river projects on the western rivers subject to specific criteria for design and operation that is the hydel projects should not change the course of the river and should not deplete the water level downstream so this is all that i wanted to discuss regarding this news article with this we will move on to the next part of a discussion that is practice questions first we will take up the prelims practice questions here there are four questions three questions will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for the day question number 1 with reference to the asiatic cheetahs consider the following statements statement number 1 in wild the asiatic cheetahs are found in iran iraq and saudi arabia statement number 2 they are enlisted as endangered in the iucn red list of threatened species statement number 3 they are slightly smaller and slender than the african cheetahs which of the statements given above is or are incorrect see here statement 1 is incorrect there are less than 100 individuals of asiatic cheetahs that are left in the wild and most of them are present in iran statement number 2 this is also incorrect the asiatic cheetahs are listed as critically endangered species in the iucn red list of threatened species here statement number 3 is correct this we saw in the discussion itself that the asiatic cheetahs are slightly smaller and slender than the african cheetahs here the question is asking for incorrect statement so the correct answer for the question is option a 1 and 2 only question number 2 consider the following statements regarding charge sheet statement number 1 charge sheets should be filed within the time frame of 60 to 90 days depending on the nature of the crime statement number 2 charge sheets does not show if an accused has been arrested or not which of the above statements is or are correct here statement 1 is correct this we saw in the discussion itself that charge sheet should be filed within the time frame of 60 to 90 days and this depends upon the nature of the crime here statement number 2 is incorrect See section 173 of the criminal procedure code gives information about what all should be there in the charge sheet and one of them is whether an accused has been arrested or not so the answer for this question is option A one only question number 3 with reference to the chemical weapons convention consider the following statements statement number 1 The convention only prohibits the usage of chemical weapons but it does not strive for their destruction. Statement number 2. India was the state party to destroy all its stockpile of chemical weapons. Statement number 3. Organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons is the implementing agency of the convention. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? Here statement number 1 is incorrect. The Chemical Weapons Convention is a multilateral treaty that bans chemical weapons and requires their destruction within a specified period of time. Then statement number 2 is correct. India was the first state party to secure the distinction of chemical weapon free state party. India was the first country to destroy all its stockpile of chemical weapons amongst all the state parties of the Chemical Weapon Convention. Here, statement number three is also correct. We saw in the discussion itself that Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons is the implementing agency of this convention. Here, the question is asking for the correct statement, so the correct answer for this question is option B, two and three only. Question number four. This is a quiz question for the day. Interested aspirants can read the question and post the answers in the comment box below. Displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below. If you have found a video to be useful, like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel. Happy learning.